I'm so nervous. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, how we love you. Your Bible says that your love and your kindness is better than life to us. I want to thank you for life is um, exemplified in moments. And this, I believe, is a God moment where you have given us enough air to breathe. You've given us strength in our bodies and uh, comprehension in our minds and receptivity in our hearts to hear your word. I thank you for your word. For your word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. Your word is what gives us fuel for living. I pray, God, in, in these few moments as we uh, give voice to your word, that you would open up, up, open up our minds, open up my mouth, that I may share your word, that the people that hear may understand your word, and that all of us uh, will find faith to do your word. We love you, and we thank you for what you're going to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Needless to say, I am more than happy to be here uh, this weekend, kind of hanging out with you all, and I'm grateful. Uh, Jeff is uh, everything that he said, and probably more to me uh, than I probably am to him uh, as a, a brother, uh, as a breakfast, amen, buddy. We met at breakfast, and that was a year or so ago, and have taken off in friendship. Our churches partner together uh, in helping the under-resourced in Aurora, uh, and uh, just the love that we share, even through Pray Fox Valley, just continues to flourish. So I'm just really excited um, to be here uh, and to hang out with you guys for the entire weekend. Um, and uh, I was told that you guys are kind of the easy bunch. Um, so I'm just kind of really expecting that to happen. So um, if this is easy, I need you to be easier. Um, uh, because I'm really just kind of hoping to practice on you guys tonight uh, because the heavy lifting is tomorrow. So, uh, but no, I, we're really happy to be here. Uh, and I do love God's word and I do love to talk about God's word. I'll tell you this, there's two things I'm most nervous about in this moment. Number one, always uh, I want to, as the Bible says, uh, 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 rightly divide the word of truth. Uh, I want to cut it straight. I'm more concerned about that than anything else. So I want to give it to you right. And then the second thing, I want to give it to you in 30 minutes. Um, uh, yeah, let me tell you, let me tell you, that is a very real challenge of mine. And so, yeah, if you're praying, oh my God, let, please don't let him preach forever, I'm praying the same thing. Because uh, there's a real poss possibility we're in trouble. Uh, but uh, as I say at my church, as I say at my church and everywhere that I go, there's a strong correlation to the length of my sermon uh, and the volume and quantity of your amens. Uh, so I'm one of those, you got to talk to me, you got to let me know you're live, you got to let me know you're still on the line uh, so that we can kind of get through this. Uh, I want to do it kind of the way I do it. Is that, is that okay? Can I just do it the way I do it? Um, so I want to read, uh, and I know, uh, and I'm excited to be a part of this wonderful series of uncomfortable grace that you all have been sharing and learning. And so I know I'm right in your wheelhouse as it relates to what God has been saying to you about his grace uh, and how sometimes it is manifested in uncomfortable ways and manners. And so I want to lift up for you a uh, verse of scripture uh, in James, James chapter chapter 4, James chapter 4, James chapter 4, and I'm going to read verses 6 through 8 of James chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. Um, Pastor James, as I call him, uh, says in his word, but God gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace and uh, gives grace, excuse me, to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Um, so you've heard about me, but I'm not really sure that you really know me. 
So let me see if I can explain to you kind of who I am. Bruce kind of knows me, but maybe you guys don't know me. I'm from Richmond, California. Richmond, California. And, and it is every bit of hood and ghetto that you could think. Richmond, California, uh, there is a low income area and it's difficult and, uh, to live there and stay alive. Crime and drugs and gangs and all of that that goes with. I'm from the ghetto, but I've never had a ghetto mentality. And what it simply means is I was raised by my father who was a pastor uh, in San Francisco at that time for 30 plus years. My mother was a county clerk and a teacher in a very popular uh, Bible study program around the world called Bible Study Fellowship. And so though I grew up in the hood, I don't have a hood mentality. And every now and then it would show up. And the instance that I'm really thinking about um, uh, was an instance when I was in about ah, the ninth grade. And a friend of mine, uh, we decided I was spending the night at his house. And we decided to go to 7-Eleven, uh, you know, get some snacks and stuff like that, soda and chips, you know, like freshmen do. The problem was we decided to go with it around 11.30 at night in the hood. And so we went and we got our uh, uh, Snickers. I got Snickers. I love Snickers. And he got whatever he got. And on our way back, I'll never forget this, 15 years old, never forget this. As we're on our way back, there pulls up this big dark van, big dark van. And as we're walking, he and I are walking towards his home, big dark van pulls up. Uh, and the driver calls out of the window, hey, who are you? And again, if you know anything about living in the hood, you can never ever uh, present that you're afraid. So I yelled back, who are you? And Mike, you know what happened there. Uh, he got out the car and it was him and his other friend got out the car and they approached us on the sidewalk. On the sidewalk, he said the same thing. Hey, who are you? Now 18 inches from my face. Again, same answer because I'm not going out like that. Who are you? All of a sudden, he hits me, bam! Hits me in my face, hit me in my eye. Oh my God, my eye is hurting. But you know, okay, well, he said he even started it. It's time to make it happen. And no sooner than I pulled my fist back to hit him back after he hit me, 11.45 in the hood on a Saturday night, just me and my friend. I see to my right, eight other people get out of the van. And before I hit him, and I don't know if it was something, but it wasn't me. Instead of swinging and hitting him, I went down, covered my face, covered my body parts. And about eight to 10 people began, if you will, what we used to call jumping us. I don't know what happened to my friend, but they were on top of me. And in that moment, all I could think about was why in the world did I go down? But then days later as I, the experience ended and we made it home, I thought about it. If I would not have went down in that moment, I could have beat him but I couldn't have beat all of them. I would have perhaps got a lick in to him, but probably would have lost my life because when I went down, I went into a defensive position. When I went down, I was able to protect myself from anything they tried to do, hit, kick, punch, or whatever. And I realized later that it wasn't my macho-ness because the macho, you know, boy in me at the time was stand up and fight like a man. Swing, hit, kick, do whatever you have to. But I know now it was the grace of God that caused me to go down. Because when I went down, I ended up saving my life. It humbled me to go down, but it saved me to go down. In that moment, I suggest to you I learned the value of going down. 
because sometimes when you go down, you're able to be in a better position to come up than standing there. Going down is what I suggest to you this sermon is all about. That God literally, in whatever situation you're in, will give you grace to go down if you choose the path of humility. The macho-ness in us, the pride in us would want to stand up strong and swing. And, but there's some things that we're dealing with that are stronger than us. And I believe the text is teaching us that if we learn how to go down in humility, every time, somebody say every time, we'll come up in victory because God will give us uncomfortable grace to help us make it. I told you, verse 6 says, he gives more grace. He opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. In our text, Pastor James, who was pastor of the church proper in Jerusalem has written this letter to Christians all over. And he's trying to tell them, listen, don't get so caught up in the world and worldliness that you stray too far away from the faith and the grace that God has made available for us. And in a very real way, live out your faith, even when you're far away from Jerusalem. Chapter one, he says, listen, I want you to be faithful in withstanding trials. Because when you are tried and your faith is tried, your strength in to persevere is, is raised. Tells them in chapter two to be faithful in their works because faith in your mind without, amen, faith in your manner of living is dead. He tells them in chapter three to be faithful in your words because you can't celebrate God in one breath and curse people out in another breath. He tells them in chapter 4 to be faithful then in the, in the midst of worldliness because worldliness will cause us to act in a contrary way to God's word. Worldliness will teach you to stand up and fight like a man. But godliness will teach you how to go down in humility and pray like a Christian for your enemies. And when you go down in humility, God will give you grace to get up in victory. In humility, we experience more grace. I like the Amplified Version. I read all kinds of scripture and versions because I'm trying to get to the meat of what God is trying to say in his word. And, and the Amplified Version of verse number six, watch this. He says, he gives more and more grace, more of the power of the Holy Spirit to meet any evil tendency of pride and all others fully. I don't know about y'all, but I want more grace. There's some stuff I'm dealing with that I can't handle on my own, and I've been standing trying to fight and to win, but I know without a shadow of that, there's no way I can win this fight. But if I learn how to humble myself and go down, I can experience the grace of God. And a matter of fact, he says, you experience more grace. Now look, here it is. This is amazing. I love this. It says, when you read in the Bible where it says more grace, that word in the Greek means, it's, it's a word that, that sounds like megas. 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 You don't even have to be a scholar to get where I'm going there. Megas. That means when you humble yourself, you experience mega grace. Yeah! Mega grace, greater in intensity. Mega grace, greater in importance. Mega grace, greater in size, scope, quantity, quality. Mega grace is translated in English as great in the New Testament, loud in the New Testament, and more in the New Testament. I thought you'd look at me like that. I thought that it may not get to you. How many of y'all may not know what mega grace is, but you know what a mega vitamin is? A mega vitamin has more than just a regular daily dose of vitamins. It has a mega dose, which is many times greater than the recommended daily allowance. If you can understand a mega vitamin, you can understand mega grace. You may not own no mega grace, but you know a mega phone. When you speak normally into a megaphone, it amplifies your voice many, many times 
All I'm simply trying to tell you is that when you just through one simple, hard, but simple act of humbling yourself, you experience mega grace. More, many more times than your daily allowance. Mega grace that speaks for you louder than you could ever imagine. It's mega. I love that because I need that mega grace. Well then, Pastor Spencer, how do I get this mega grace? It's in the Bible. Look at what he says. In verse number six, he says, therefore, he says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Number one, the way you get this mega grace is by relaxing your pride. When you and I learn how to relax our pride, then we tap into the mega grace of God. It's uncomfortable to humble yourself, but it's unmatched to receive the grace of God. I like the way that sounded. It's uncomfortable to humble yourself in situation where the world tells you to stand up like a man, but it is unmatched by the grace of God when you and I do it his way. He rejects the prideful. Pride is a deep feeling of pleasure and satisfaction in our own achievements, our own accomplishments, our own appearance, our own abilities, our own agenda. That's pride. It's an inward focus on self. It's an inflated focus on self. And listen, pride is the, sin, is the inspiration for all sinful attitudes and actions. You don't believe me, listen to Adam. You remember what Adam said in the garden, didn't you? Adam said this, half of this he said it to himself. But he said, listen, when he was faced with the opportunity to sin by eating the fruit that Eve offered it to him, instead of resisting, humbling himself, he didn't want to look bad in front of that woman. He simply said, he said, listen, well, she offered it, but I wanted it. So I took it and I ate it and I blamed her for it. You see that? That's not humility, that's pride. It's her fault. And when you're prideful, everything is everybody else's fault and not yours. God hates pride and bros is prideful people. Pride even violates the first commandment. Thou shalt have no other God, right? When you're prideful, who becomes the God in your life? Yes, you. God resists the prideful, but he received those that submit to him. Verse seven says, submit yourselves therefore to God. Listen, we have a sinful nature and a tendency to pridefulness, but the cure for pride is humility. Humility is not thinking less of yourself but it's thinking more of others. It's putting others in front of you. And it is the attitude that Paul said we should have in Philippians 2. He said, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who didn't think that his equality with God was something to be grasped. But he literally emptied himself of himself so he could be what we need him, needed him to be. If I was at my church, I'd be shouting right now, hallelujah. <laughs> because to think that God, who is all that and a bag of chips, would voluntarily empty himself of himself so he could be what I needed him to be, and not just momentarily, but to do it as a lifestyle, and, it knew, and he knew beforehand it would lead him to die. He did it for me. And the only way he could do it was by humbling himself, veiling his glory, choosing to be seen like a man and obedient to other men. He did it. He's our example. And listen, my brothers and sisters, I want to tell you, Lord told me to tell you that you and I need to own it. Own it. Own the areas of pride in your life. 
Yeah, you have a right and a responsibility to stand up for yourself. Yeah, they did you wrong, so you have a right to cut them off. Yeah, you have a right. Somebody cut you in line. You got a right to complain and say whatever. But what is God telling you to do? Humble yourself. I'll be that this, this, on this occasion. That's fine. I know it's wrong. Whitney Houston said this about Bobby Brown. She said, it ain't right, but it's okay. Because you get to this place when you are in God and your number one goal is to please God, not to look good for people. And you get to this place where you learn that in order for me, amen, to please God and to experience this great mega grace, I have to relax my pride. Not only do I have to relax my pride, but number two, we must resist the devil. It's uncomfortable, but we got to do it. It's uncomfortable to resist the devil. Verse 7b says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. God gives grace to those who in humility relax their pride, but also those who resist the devil. Uncomfortable grace alert. Do -do -do -do. When you go down in humility, it will feel like all the time you are forfeiting to the enemy. But in reality, you are following God yourself you even play tricks on yourself I ain't, I ain't really I'm not doing that no I'm no I'm not doing that that just sounds like I, I'm just I could really win this thing if I do it like this and that and go here and if I talk to her like this you know and I just be you know how we, 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 we try to fix it up we lovingly confront <laughs> The truth of the matter is God tells you to be quiet and just take it and pray and be nice. But we lovingly confront. <laughs> Not out of God's leadership, but out of our own pride because there's no way you're going to treat me like that. But it feels uncomfortable. Here's what I want to suggest to you in resisting the devil. Stand if you can. Stand if you can. Paul says to church, to the church at Ephesus in chapter 6, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. Stand if you can. Stand when the enemy is coming against you. Stand when you can. Do it as long as you can. But here's what I learned. If you're going to stand, you shouldn't just stand, amen, un, 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 unprotected. He says to that church, he says, put on the helmet of salvation breastplate of righteousness, gospel shoes of peace, the belt of truth, have in your one hand the shield of faith, other hand the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. If you're going to stand, stand like a Christian. Stand like a Christian. And, and your only offense ought to be the word of God. If you're going to stand, stand. But there are some times, and I've learned this, Jeff, and if it's wrong, you fix it up that there's sometimes you need to run. Somebody say run. I've learned that there's sometimes and we got to run because there's some stuff we just can't handle. Men, you ought to know what I'm talking about. Pride will challenge you to stand, but the wisdom of humility tells you to run. I got an example. First Corinthians 6, 18, the Bible says, flee fornication. Bruce, he doesn't tell us to stand and fight and be strong and say, I'm not affected. I don't see that. I don't feel that. Nope, that's not happening. No, he says, tuck your tail and run. It's not, there's nothing wrong with you when the Lord leads you to, there's some stuff you just can't handle. Ladies, there's some stuff you can't handle either when somebody calls you on the phone and says, I just, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not operating in the spirit of gossip. I, I'm not, I'm just, I just want to lovingly confront the situation and here's what's going on. And, and you know it's gossip when she says, I heard. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you, didn't think, you didn't think I knew y'all gossip too, huh? And so, in those instances, we run away, hang up the phone, change your number if you have to. <laughs> and the Bible says, if we resist the devil, he will flee. And another fight in school came up. I don't want y'all to think that I'm a brawler and I fight all the time, but I think of another fight in school, and I think I was about in the 10th grade, and this time I'm in this fight, and, um, you know, I, I run because, you know, he's bigger than me. 
but I, I want to suggest to you, I did something really smart this time when I ran, Bruce. When I ran, I didn't just run willy-nilly, but I ran because my brother was a senior in high school. I was a sophomore. And so I ran, where do you think I ran? I ran behind my brother. And what happened when I ran behind my brother? The sophomore who was running me, who was bigger than me, when I got behind my brother, he saw my brother, he wasn't gonna beat my brother. So instead of continuing to run after me, because I was behind my brother, you're gonna get it in a minute. He ran away from my brother because my brother was bigger than me. Come here, let me preach to you, I feel it here. When you have a big God in your life, and he's strong, and he's mighty, and he can fight your battles, when you get to a situation that you can't handle, it's okay to run as long as you run to God. When you run behind God, the enemy, whatever's going on, the problem that is too big for you, it's nothing for God, and if you run behind it, the problem will run away from you. Which is my last point. Verse number eight. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. In order for us to gain this mega grace from God, through the uncomfortability, we have to run to God. Literally run to him. Pride causes us to drift away from God. But when we run and recognize that God is the source of our grace, we run to him. How do we do it? He says, cleanse your hands. I knew I would be running out of time when I got here, so I found a way to quickly illustrate my point. He says, cleanse your hands. I thought about this, and I looked up some stuff. You medical doctors help me uh, when I'm done if I get it wrong. But your, your hand, on each square centimeter of your hand, I've learned that there are about 15,000 bacteria. Each centimeter of your hand, there's about 1,500, I'm sorry, 1,500 bacteria. I did the math. I'm five foot six. My hands are about 7.26 inches large, 18.44 centimeters. That's 27,000. 660 bacteria that are currently living on my hands. You gonna shake my hand when we're done? <laughs> here, 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 here it is. My hands easily contract bacteria. My hands pretty much touch everything that I come in contact with. My hands easily spread bacteria all over my body, but also on others. If I don't wash my hands, everything on me and everybody I touch will potentially be effect, infected by the 27,660 bacteria that's currently on my hands. Now let me spiritualize it the sanitary benefits of washing my hands. My pride is like the bacteria that infects my entire body. It affects every part of my soul because it touches everything in my life. My faith, my joy, my peace, my hope, my service, my worship, my living as a husband, as a father, as a friend. And when I wash my hands through repentance and faith in God, he restores me. I literally find healing in every area of my life. That's how important the mega grace of God is. It will affect you in every area. Well, we gotta clean our hands. We gotta purify our hearts. The heart is where the blood pumps through every part of our body. It's, the Bible teaches us in Levitical understanding that the life of the body is in the blood. And if we have to purify our hearts, that means there's impurities in our hearts. That, are, that is affecting our very life. What if pride was affecting your very life? It's all over your hands. It's all over your spirit. Now it's inside 
of what give, gives the mechanisms in your spiritual life energy? What if pride motivates you to serve? What if pride motivates you to give? Then, then you're infected. But he says, you got to come back to me. You have to purify your heart, clean your hands. And then he says, stop being double-minded. He said in chapter one, a double-minded man is unstable in his ways. That means we don't know whether you're coming or going. We don't know if you're with us or not. And God can't count on us. Because when everything we do and say and think is superimposed with pride, we will always think and judge and evaluate things in terms of ourselves. What will make my life better? What will make church more convenient for me? What will make this home better for me? You see how pride gets into everything? But if we run back to God by humbling ourselves, by going down, what literally happens is this mega grace lifts us up. I want to close by suggesting to you simply this, that in the story that I gave you, it's real. I fell down, I covered myself. And when I fell down and when I covered myself, my pain was minimized because I went down. My pain was minimized. But also, after a while, the episode ended. Because I heard them say, man, let's get out of here. We ain't hurting him. Man, let's get out of here. We're wasting our time. Man, let's get out of here. I'm done. And what looked like a move of surrendering to them was the strongest move that I could make to save my life. What if your next move was humble? What if you chose to go down instead of standing up for your rights? But you finally hear God saying, I know it's uncomfortable, but go down. Here's what I promise you, that the mega grace of God will lift you up. The episode will be less painful and it won't last as long as it's lasting right now because you're standing up there and fighting. Your best fight is on your knees. Your best fight is loving those that curse you. Your best fight is blessing those who are evil to you. But right now, you're struggling because you're trying to fight something in your life that you can't win on your own strength. But when you go down in humility, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, he will exalt you. Pastor Spencer, how can you be so sure? Well, on a Friday, several years ago, Jesus could have called legions of angels because he was in a fight he could not win. They had condemned him to die on a cross for a crime he did not commit. Some preachers say he was guilty of nothing more than love in the first degree. And he was on a cross dying instead of suspending time so he could take a break. Instead of calling a squadron of angels to come rescue him, he went down. He died. He went down into the grave, allowed himself to stay dead for three days. Sunday morning, the mega grace of God 
the mega grace of God cause him to be resurrected. And if he's our example, if he can get up from the dead, then I want to suggest to you there's nothing, nothing, nothing that you're going through that he cannot raise you up from. But you got to own it. It's uncomfortable. And put yourself in position for God's uncomfortable grace to be yours. It was uncomfortable for him. But you can have it today whether you've walked away from God in pride. You can come back by just humbling yourself. Or whether you've never known a God like this. I promise you. He's not going to let you take one step of humility without meeting it with his mega grace. I know it because he does it for me and he'll do it for you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your mega grace, a grace that we did not earn, a grace that goes beyond our imagination and it's a grace that you made available to us for salvation for forgiveness for strength for peace for love for hope and for joy but our biggest problem is not you it's us we keep trying to live our own life and find yours Help us today to humble ourselves, seek your face, and find you with your arms wide open, giving us this mega grace. I want it. I want to live in it. I want to stay in it. I don't want to go too far from it. Help me. Help us. Go down in humility, trusting that we'll get up because of your amazing grace. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen.